Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Networks, CRE, PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today, my guest is Ken Van Lu. He's a real estate uh, investor and his uh, career has taken him through flipping houses, new construction and development, and assisted living. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Ken about real estate development and investing. But first, a quick reminder, if you like our show, CRE PN Radio, there are a couple things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you'd like to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Ken. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thank you very much, Darren. It's my pleasure to be here today. Really looking forward to adding some value and talking commercial real estate, risk management, all that good stuff. Well, I'm delighted to have you. And uh, before we get going, though, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Sure, sure. You know, I um, started out and was told, you know, go off to college, get a few degrees, and you'll be very, very successful. So, you know, I followed that direction from my dad, and I, I went off to study civil engineering, but I, I, you know, really wanted to play sports in high school. So as a sport jock advocate, um, you know, currently I'm with the same woman after 38 years, had three wonderful children, twins. My son's a U.S. intelligence Marine officer, my daughter married a doctor, nutritionist, diet, dietitian, youngest, very, very successful. So first and foremost, father, successful businessman, developer, uh, you know, call myself, uh, you know, king of skyscrapers, was fortunate to build a bunch of skyscrapers in New York City. But by profession, as I said, um, you know, started off, created the six-year plan in college, became a professional civil engineer, went ahead wanting to be a civil engineer, but, you know, did a master's in civil engineering and then really figured that, you know, I wanted to develop. So I had acquired a master's in real estate development from NYU and had this illustrious career in New York City building skyscrapers. And then my claim to fame was developing a $17 million assisted living with really no real estate experience and no money, no one of my own money. And that's what led to, you know, the writing of the modern wealth building formula and financial freedom protocol and the good things we're doing today. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you, you've had uh, quite a bunch or, you know, quite a bit of experience. Um, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, building uh, skyscrapers. What was your role in that? Was that as an engineer or what, how were you? Yeah, no, I, um, I played many roles in building skyscrapers over the years. When I was 26 years old, after building as a superintendent um, on a 32 unit building in Poughkeepsie, I was offered a position to build two 33 story buildings as a project superintendent for the Left Rack organization. And that led me to ultimately build a billion dollar pro project in Brooklyn for, you may have heard of him, Bruce Ratner. He owned the New Jersey Nets. And, uh, you know, that's where I kind of earned my stripes. I worked myself from up from Project Super to senior PM, ultimately project executive, went on to work for a couple big developers and then developed along with another co-developer, a project on 240 Park Avenue. It was a 30 story building, which, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting Tom Brady, who came to look at the penthouse. But, you know, I was basically... Uh, trained by the number one CM company in the world, Lear McGovern Bovis. They restored the Statue of Liberty. Um, I went to work for them. It was just Lear McGovern. They were eventually bought by Bovis. I was trained through that organization. And, you know, at one point I was standing on top of the skyscraper I built and I had twins and I was six figures in debt going like, you know, I have to, I have to do something because this job thing as a super building skyscrapers is paying me six figures. But, you know, I, I was spending more than I was making. You know, and that's when I really um, figured, you know, if I can build a $10 million project, I could pay myself close to 15% fees between a 5% development fee, 8% general conditions, and the 3% construction management fee. 
I'd be into business and would never have to look back. So that's what I did. You know, I plugged in a 113 bed assisted living. That was my first deal out of the pipeline. And then I learned in reverse. I call it top down thinking. Fast forward, you know, 2000, that happened in 2000, essentially. By um, 2015, I had a company called Flipping New Jersey, Flipping USA, where we did 137 residential deals in one year. And then shortly thereafter, that is when I wrote the modern wealth building formula, articulating what I had done over the last 20 years, building skyscrapers, commercial buildings, um, big site developments, all kinds of great things. And it was all due to this formula that I, you know, I put in writing and the system of how to find, fund, and facilitate real estate. Oh, that's awesome. I love the uh, realization there as you're building these uh, skyscrapers, uh, recognizing, you know, that you're, you're not getting the, the full value of, of just being a, a participant, but to, to, to actually, you know, participate on the equity side or, you know, have to, to, to be an investor in the, the uh, project. Um, yeah, thank you. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't. I, and I probably I thought I maybe I didn't ask you ask your question. So so I started off, um, you know, building these projects at every single level in the construction management field. And then I was fortunate in 96 before I went out on my own in 99 to go work for, um, you know, Bruce Eichner and a couple other major developers in New York City. And then, um, you know, did my own down the road in 2008. But, you know, it, it was great. Um, because I was able to, you know, graduate in engineering. I won the senior design award, which was a site development. It was a 13 acre site where they said, okay, it's a one acre zoning design. it." So I, you know, I designed a cul-de-sac with 12 Watts and drainage. And in 1985, I did this in CAD and literally blew my professors out of the water. They're like, who is this guy? And, uh, that's when it planted the seed that I'm going to develop one day, but I didn't know any better. And here I'm like cracking my teeth, playing football, drinking too much beer, you know, trying to become an engineer. And, you know, six years later, um, you know, I became one, fortunately, because I met the woman I'm with today who, uh, you know, taught me how to study calculus and all that good stuff. But, you know, it was just fortunate because that planted the seed like, wow, if I can design them, fast forward, I started building them, I could build them, go back and get a second master's degree when NYU learn how to finance them, I could maybe do this myself. You know, you know, because coming from a family, you know, with full love and, 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 you know, and, and, you know, to give you the motivation, but, you know, my dad worked for PSENG, an electrical company, climbing telephone poles, running a crew, and my mom was a bank teller, you know, and all they knew was, hey, we didn't go to college, go to school, get a degree, get a great job, and, and you'll do phenomenal, you know, little did they know, you know, 18% interest when I got married, and, you know, you needed you know, 30, 40 grand for a deposit for a house. It wasn't easy, you know, and it's even tougher today with kids, you know? So, you know, I share that with you to, to see what opens up and how we can give the listeners some value. So it reduces friction for them to get to where they want to go, you know? Yeah, no, I, I love the, uh, you know, I think so often, I guess, one of the things that's um, kind of a reality check is just how many people are involved in a real estate transaction and how few of them are actually involved as in investors, you know, even if it's their career, uh, whether it be a real estate broker or, or lender or, you know, anybody on the construction side of things, they, uh, they're, they're not always invested in it, even though they understand how to do, how to make the, the, the project. And uh, it always, I don't know, always, I, I, ever since I've understood the value of being an investor, I'm going like, that's what I want. I want somebody else to pay me uh kind of thing and and it just it's always been kind of a uh a goal of mine is to have more of that uh, not even understand what it was when i when i first did it but just knowing that i wanted that yeah um so uh, you, you could say that again yeah, there there yeah. are a lot a lot of players involved you, you 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 wouldn't imagine all the moving parts in a development you know and, and it's nice to be the investor you know um you know fortunately i don't have to get as deep into the weeds, but, you know, I find myself on, you know, we have a 45 acre piece in North Carolina and I'm, you know, have my hands in the mix of the engineering and the design standards and, you know, things that I could help accelerate the process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
So in, one of the other things that that's always been kind of a, a mystery to me of sorts, and that, uh, you know, I, the, the timeline it takes to develop a project, um, I can only imagine what, how, how long did it take you when you were building these 30 story buildings from breaking ground to a uh, final occupancy uh, permits? Yeah, great question. I um, would usually take about 19 months and we would move in, you know, our first say seven floors. So, you know, you'd have to have the building complete elevators running. And normally the first it was a 30 story building. You would deliver the building and what we would call four different temporary certificate of occupancies, you know, and, and it would go from, you know, 19 months to probably like 26 months before you'd have it fully occupied. Yeah. No, it's just, it's, it's, uh, you know, when you're, when you're in the, the, the market for something and you're looking for a finished product, you, you know, there's a, just the, the, uh, make the offer, uh, due diligence, you know, financing close, you can usually handle that in like 90 to 120 days on a smaller project. But when you start thinking about like, you know, 24 months to just to build it, uh, not, not even talking about the design and, you know, the zoning and whatever else may have taken place prior to that. It's, it's always a little bit of a, um, yeah. you know, a reality check there. Yeah. Um, yeah, most projects you're you know you're you're writing underwriting for three four years down the down the road you know from the time you're you know spending your first soft cost you know yeah yeah no, exactly um so you were you were working for others building uh in new, new york city did you invest yourself directly in new york city or where whereabouts were you uh when you yeah, yeah, my this. first investments were in New York City, New Jersey, um, you know, primarily in this metropolitan area, you know, and I really, you know, followed, you know, what my mentor said, you know, you should <clears throat> try to be within an hour, you know, of, of what you're trying to accomplish. And, you know, it took many years before we started branching out, you know, into North Carolina, Texas, Florida, you know, and, and made some acquisitions. Um, you know, and, and now I'm doing some developments in other states. So we have stuff in Jersey, New York, North Carolina on the development side. You know, and it's really just about being confident that you can have the control system then, right? Because you don't want to let those big animals get out of control. You know, some of these bigger projects, you know, like like we were, you know, briefly touching upon, you know, it's it's risk versus reward, you know, what you know, what's the risk, you know, as far as, um, you know, being able to deliver it. So it's all about. No. Oh. So I, I'm guessing uh, just talking risk and reward there uh, with as long as you've been doing this, I'm, I'm assuming there may have been a project or maybe two that were, didn't go as planned. Um, can you share a, a story of, uh, of how things might've gotten out of control or, or lessons you might've learned from, from a, uh, a project? Yeah, yeah. The, you know, I, 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 I've been pretty fortunate, but, you know, it's funny because I'm, you know, I'm glad because on the projects that I guess you can say I blew the budget and the time, you know, it was on, you know, when I got into some of the, the residential stuff where I was getting into the fixing and flipping and, and, you know, my, my systems, you know, wasn't something I guess I, you know, I did initially. And, you know, there was, you know, ones that I bought and, you know, I figured, you know, I was going to make a hundred grand and, you know, I, I'd lucky if I made 20, you know, there was others where I would, um, you know, for, you know, I'd miss that there was a, a lien. And I remember I'm, I'm getting ready to go to a closing, supposed to make like 27 grand and, you know, a $20,000 lien popped up, you know, and a lot of the bigger projects that I was involved in, you know, I, I guess my, my troubles came where, you know, I had a property in Jersey City on the water that I was supposed to close. And, you know, I was working with some investors that that uh, I, I didn't really know well, and, and they didn't show up at the closing with the money, <laughs> you know, and uh, I couldn't close on the property. And, you know, I learned my lesson about, you know, you have to have the money in escrow. <laughs> you have to write the check, you know, you know, um, you know, and, and, and I learned, you know, so, you know, it was all about structure you know, more control in place. Don't think that the little ones can't get away from you. You know, you got to follow, you know, like the way you do anything is the way you do everything. So, 
you know, if you're building a skyscraper and you got to build the thing on paper right down, you know, to the last screw, you know, because with skyscrapers, you know, we literally build them on paper when, you know, when you're breaking ground on a skyscraper, the thing is essentially, you know, 80% bought out because you have to have a guaranteed maximum price because the bank won't fund you unless they know it's under control, you know, and, and that's the key, you know, so you have to buy precisely within budget. And then once you get to like 70% of the buy, you have to guarantee the maximum price and then the funds flow as needed to, to accelerate. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good reminder. Just, you know, having systems and, and uh, some structure so you can, you know, every time it's the same thing, kind of like in golf, the repeatable swing, you know, don't, don't make it up every time, you know? Yeah. Um, Pre -shot so, <laughs> oh yeah. No, if you, if you have that, at least you have a chance, you know, as opposed to just constantly making it up and, and uh, not knowing what you're doing. Um, you mentioned a, a formula and it sounds like you've written some books. Is that, did I glean that from the yeah, this, this, this book we wrote in uh, 2019 that did real well. It hit uh, number one, I believe, in 29 categories in four countries. And Jack Canfield put his, you know, testimonial on the front cover. Dolph DeRouge wrote the uh, foreword. He was one of my mentors. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I should have called it the Modern Wealth Millionaire Formula. But, you know, the Modern Wealth Building Formula is um, something that came out of me. You know, I, I was a big personal, I'm still a big personal development. And, you know, the acronym, I was with my team one day and, you know, I was talking about Tony Robbins and massive action. And, you know, I just, you know, we were all from Landmark and we had just taken this wisdom course. And, you know, I was like, you know, this is about bold leadership and forward thinking. And next thing you know, someone said modern wealth building formula. And I was like, yeah, that's, that has a nice ring to it. And next thing you know, I was on this journey, which took a year to write a book because, you know, I'm an engineer, you know, I guess left brainer by, you know, by uh, uh, anatomy, you know, and, and writing a book was, was different. You know, I, 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 it wasn't something I was good at. You know, I averaged about one chapter a month, but when it came out, it was fabulous, you know, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, thank God, you know, that I get, I get a chance to pay it forward now, you know. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. So you've moved through kind of some different uh, strategies, different uh, asset classes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the different uh, asset classes and, and what you've done and, and perhaps, you know, what was it that, that, you know, introduced you or appealed to you to go from one to the other, yeah. as opposed to just staying in one, you know, one asset class kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it all started of, of my learning, you know, very untraditional in the sense that when I started analyzing deals, you know, it was from a from a development perspective, which always had a multi-use component. So I, I always thought from being involved in a lot of projects, you know, hey, there's a retail component, there's a commercial component, there's a residential. So when I started to look at real estate, I started to look at it not necessarily from a from a type, but from an investment that meets a certain criteria that the investor wants to invest in. So whether it was a self storage or an assisted living or a commercial office building, or a CVS I'm doing now or affordable housing, um, I now have a hotel, a wellness center, townhomes. You know, to me, they're just a component that you look at. And if, and if it meets the criteria, you can, you could syndicate it essentially. And, you know, that's how I kind of looked at it, you know, and then I had to, of course, you know, you know, tame, you know, my, you know, my tendency to look at too many things at once, you know, like, Hey, let's stick with these three things. So if I get into a project that has too many uses, for example, and in, in one we're doing in Chester, New Jersey, um, I sold off the affordable housing component because I can't build as cheap as the affordable housing guy because he has that system of affordable housing in place. He uses those types of contractors, he uses those materials. He has that relationship with the agency and the state to get the to get the grants that are needed. You know what I'm saying? And and I don't have time at this stage of my career to figure that out. You know, like you know, I know enough about healthcare. 
I know enough about retail. I know enough about industrial. You know, I could, I could do regular housing. I could do commercial. And you don't want to be, you know, jack of all trades, master of none, you know? So, and you got to know what you don't know eventually, you know, and admit to it and be brutally honest if you want to like get forward, you know? So that's my take on it. You know, I look at it, um, you know, like I said, you know, if someone's looking, you know, because you have all different kinds of investors, you know, you have, you know, guys that want your firstborn and, you know, if you're not paying them 20%, they don't want to talk to you. Um, you have your hard money lenders that, you know, that go right up to the usury law. You have, um, and then you, and then you have the other side of the spectrum that you give someone six and if they get 10, they're delighted and they're with you forever, you know? And you got to be able, I always tell, you know, my clients that when I'm training them to raise money, you know, you got to, you got to build rapport, of course, with any investor, but you want to find out where are they at in that spectrum? You know, do they have money in the bank that they're not earning that you could put it to work for them and you become like a partner with them, you know, they're going to be with you for a long time. So, you know, that's my two cents on, uh, on, project types and investments and i guess the last part of the question was um you know how did i settle in you know i mean i i like um i like medical office because you know medical office was something that i felt had less risk you know obviously for like a pandemic scenario um we have like 24 of them and we did okay um and you know i've always you know, shied away from retail because, you know, you know, I saw the internet kind of slowly shutting it down type of thing and stuck towards the residential, you know, obviously if you can ever get a hold of anything on the industrial storage side, you know, try to jump all over it. But that's what I kind of learned in my uh, gallivanting in real estate, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I like the, I mean, being able to identify what it is and then recognize what you're good at and what you're not good at and being able to let go of that. I, I think that it's so often the case that people are so hungry for an opportunity. They don't always recognize whether or not it's a good opportunity for them. Yeah. Uh, and they hold on tight to something that's never going to materialize because they, they don't have the skills or the, the, the resources to, to see it to the finish line. So that's yeah. definitely yeah. a positive thing. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, raising money, uh, syndicating. Is that, primarily the the uh, way you go about uh, raising funds for your projects yeah you know i it's it's been so I, i've always syndicated my first project that you know I, I i use the word syndication i guess because you know i've always put together excuse me partnerships where i've you know broken up the shares raised money and kind of reverse engineered into you know the largest slice i could take i guess you could say you know and then you know, when I first started, I, I, I didn't have equity. So I knew I was, my slice was going to be small. So I was focused on fees, you know, how to get out of the box. And, and as I grew, you know, I was able to take a larger slice and share fees and, and things like that. And um, I might be going off on a tangent, but, you know, I, I, on the questioning, but, um, you know, that's kind of how my thinking was initially. And, and, and I, I don't think I answered your question, but, um, no, it was just, I was just trying to understand, if, you know, how, how did you uh, go about, you know, raising the capital basically? And, and you said, you know, partnerships or, or, you know, yeah, some yeah, sort so, of other yeah, people's so, money kind of thing, syndications yeah, or. Yeah. So New York, I guess you could say a little different. There was a lot of, you know, a lot of money. So, you know, we would, you know, do in reverse that you would do, I guess, in a, in a more securitized, you know, offering where you know the the money investors get 70 percent of the project and the gp gets 30 where in we you know in, in new york it was the opposite you know we would sell off 30 percent and keep 70 for ourselves and do it with just like offering memorandums and it was very simple because you know money was just around the corner you know and then when i got out of new york a couple of years ago you know just because things went haywire you know, I was like, okay, you know, it's not as easy to raise money. So should I get more securitized? My, my next raise was only, I think, 5 million to buy this 28 acre Chester center of town. And, um, you know, and then I started to think where I'm at now, where in order to really 
take on like a hundred million dollar project that we have in North Carolina, you know, I've been considering putting a fund together in a more securitized format. But um, I've always been fortunate, I guess, just, you know, to, to have a decent track record where people have, you know, hung in with me over the years. And most of my projects have never been, um, I guess, outside of New York, you know, astronomical numbers where, you know, I needed to go raise 30, 40 million dollars where now, you know, I, I'm in that position and, you know, I don't want to have to call hundreds of people to raise that. I'd rather get, you know, attract a family office and build that type of relationship at this stage in my career. No, absolutely. If you, if you can have fewer, uh, bigger, bigger uh, investors, I would think the, uh, just to be able to control the relationships, I think would be a, a one less uh, hassle or, or diff challenge, I'll say, challenge. Um, uh, you'd mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, a mentor of yours. Can you speak to the, the value of, of mentorship and, and uh, lessons maybe you learned from, from your mentors? Yes, I, I, I will tell you that, you know, there aren't many shortcuts in life, but I would say mentorship is a, is a good shortcut to consider. Um, not in the sense that um, it will necessarily save a tremendous amount of time, but it, it will, I believe, save you a tremendous amount of worry and viewpoint that you have to reinvent the wheel, because if you can mirror and model a mentor that's already done it, it's going to, you know, reduce a lot of the friction that you're going to have moving forward. You know, I've had mentors, you know, in, in the personal development side, I've had mentorships in real estate on the physical side, you know, because when, you know, when you get into big time real estate, you know, and, and developing skyscrapers, you know, the, the game, the kickoff every day, it starts at like six in the morning, you know, so, you know, for, for over 20 years, I woke up at five and I walked in the door at midnight because, you know, between working and then going to school at NYU at night, and, you know, I, I, I got home late every night. It was just, it was really crazy. Or that's when I would go to bed, you know, maybe I'd walk in at like 11, but I'd be so wound up from the day. And, and that's how it was, you know, and, and one day I looked back um, in 2008 when we lost $330 million in one year, one, one day. <laughs> Um, when Lehman Brothers crashed, you know, and I didn't want to do real estate anymore. Eventually, I realized, wow, I had 125,000 hours in real estate development and construction. And I was doing it subconsciously at that time, you know, unconsciously conscious. And, um, you know, after a couple of years of being in the funk, you know, I went back in head first. And by 2015, I actually cracked the code and was pouring concrete towers in New York City, non-union. So um, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> wow. Well, it's definitely a, a, a major shift of events there from, uh, you know, th th that whole time in, in uh, space is, is pretty dramatic. Everybody's got some, some sort of a uh, tie to that. Yeah. Um, but uh, glad you, you were able to make it through and back and, and uh, back on your feet there. Um, I'm curious, you've talked about a lot of, or we've talked a lot about, about your, your building of assets and stuff and, and with uh, the investors in it, has your strategy been primarily to, to build and, and sell, or have you been able to build and retain in, in a portfolio or how are you set up yeah. that way? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I, I would say I, I, I didn't learn the hard way, but my original strategy only because I knew development and because in New York City, you, you at one point, you know, we made like $50 million on 240 Park Avenue because you would build for like 1400 a square foot and you would sell for 1800 to 2100 a square feet. You know, like it was just ridiculous. And, you know, we would keep the, the first floor the retail, you know, and that was for many, many years, the only assets that I was retaining because, you know, I, I, I just didn't know any better. You know, I was, I was kind of like a developer and I look back, especially when the pandemic hit and I was like, wow, what if I owned those 300 units and I didn't sell them, you know, would I be collecting rent right now? So, you know, and I never really wanted to go down that thought process, but, you know, like it wasn't until, you know, you know, several years thereafter, where we began to accumulate the office buildings, 
Um, and, and still a lot of our profits were, you know, get the entitlement approval and then sell off the approvals to other developers. And then at this stage, you know, we're taking on our developments. We're, you know, building the CVS, North Carolina. I intend on building the townhomes and some of the other things. So, you know, it's like anything else, you know, we're all growing and graduating and, and taking on things, you know, to reduce the path of resistance, you know? No, totally. No, I think there's always uh, the opportunity for reflection and, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda, but, um, you know, and, and like you said, you, you kind of learn, learn as you go and, and, uh, you know, if you're able to course correct and, and do things differently, but, but, uh, no, I, I, I just love the, I, I love everybody's, I, I love to hear the story of everybody's journey in real estate and just, yeah. you know, cause I think a lot of it, uh, it's one thing to, you know, read a bunch of books and listen to a bunch of podcasts and go to a bunch of seminars and everything. But until you're actually, you know, you're in it and you're the one that's kind of sweating the details or, you know, I, I, I mean, I can't think of a closing I've ever gone to where I haven't had a little bit of a sense of like, it, it, did we check all the numbers twice? I mean, there, there's just some sort of a sense of like, um, you know, here we go uh, kind of thing. And, and it, it, it doesn't, uh, I guess the, the level of unknown or uncertainty isn't nearly as high as it once was, but it's, it's still, you know, when you, when you get in and, and, uh, you know, live bullets are flying, it's different than, than, uh, you know, talking about it. So, mm -hmm. so but, um, no, that's great. Hey, uh, Ken, if we could, I'd like to uh, shift gears here for a second. Sure. Um, by day I'm an insurance broker and, uh, I work with my clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. And there's a couple of different strategies we typically consider. Uh, we first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. And if that's not an option, then we look and see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And when we cannot avoid nor minimize the risk, then we look to see if we can transfer the risk. And that's what an insurance policy is. It's a risk uh, transfer vehicle. And so I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. Uh, you can frame this however you like. Uh, it could be your clients, investors, the market, um, interest rates, you know, whatever. But if you can take a look at your situation and identify what you consider to be the biggest risk. And uh, again, for clarification, while I am a, an insurance broker, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. And uh, so if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Ken Van Lu, what is the biggest risk? Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, you can look at risk in a couple different contexts, you know, um, you know, one, you know, you obviously want to look at the risk, you know, of your personal life. You know, I've been in situations where I've done big projects or, you know, where I've, you know, I've placed all my assets in a trust and, you know, things were to go array, you know, in the sense of building projects, you know, in a lot of cases, I used to have to put up performance bonds. You know, so, you know, it was a, a, a large sense of, uh, you know, similar to like a personal guarantee, you know, and when the bonding company steps in, which you're, you know, being an insurance must be very familiar, you know, we used to um, get into, you know, sub guard policies and, you know, because, you know, bonding was very expensive. Um, the construction in the high rise we talked about before, um, the construction portion of it was always the highest risk, right? Um, some of those contractor contracts were in the neighborhood of $50 million. You're buying, you know, curtain walls from all different parts of the world. You know, I was traveling to Italy and Canada and, you know, making sure things are getting on the boat in time and, you know, all these little things, everything had to work like clockwork. And, you know, in that world, it was, it was extremely risky. And what we used to do is, you know, we would bond every single trade if we had to. Or if I couldn't bond the trades, I would have to subguard the entire project um, in order to you know, satisfy the bank, you know, in, in case something happened, um, this, this, this mechanism was in place to save the day. Um, you know, and, and I guess, you know, if you're just looking at an investment, um, you know, there's risk with that, you know, you want to make sure 
you know, you're buying an asset, you know, there's not going to be this huge capital expenditure. You know, my, my expertise in building buildings, you know, I can go in and, you know, jump in an elevator shaft and tell you, you know, when the thing's going to, you know, you know, cr you know, die, you know, I could go and look at central HVAC plants from building data centers and, you know, what's, know what's going to happen. So, you know, I think the biggest risk with, with people buying existing assets is, is not knowing what they're looking at, you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, you know, oh shoot, I got to, you know, upgrade the electrical service to 400 amps to get the tenant upstairs. And that means digging the road. And I had these two dentists that had a building in White Plains. They wanted to convert it to residential, but we needed to upgrade the gas service and the water service. And, you know, they waited too long and then they started building 400 unit next door. And I'm like, guys, you got to pull the trigger now, you know? So those are the kind of risks, you know, not knowing what you don't know, or not like we said before, recognizing what you don't know and, and, you know, getting out of your own way, you know, cause our egos, you know, I think, um, you know, sometimes on a personal level. So, so there's all different kinds of levels. I think all different kinds of contexts, you know, so, you know, I talk about personal existing assets, how the development is viewed and, and how, you know, I think that insurance aspect comes into play, um, you know, in, you know, in that, in that case. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's a great insight. And I appreciate you kind of taking us through that. Um, I, uh, well, I, I deal with uh, construction quite a bit and bonding in that it's uh, not always that you, that everybody understands that that element of it, you know, and, and what its purpose is and how it works. Yeah. So it's definitely yeah. a, a different thing there. Hey, Ken, uh, where can the listeners go if they'd like to connect with you or learn more? Yes, you know, check out my 11millionairesecrets.com. That's just some free gifts I give. And, you know, if you're serious and you want to talk to me, um, you can go to my website. It's kenvanloo.com. There's um, a free planning call. Literally, you can schedule a call directly with me. And uh, if for some reason, I don't think you're real, I won't call you. But most cases, you won't fill out the application unless you're real. And, and we chat. And, you know, I just I'm just here to try to help you. You know, I, um, you know, I wrote the book, you know, I have what's called is the global real estate investment enterprise, where once people join, they can't get out. It's like uh, like the mafia, I guess you could say. <laughs> and um, you know, we you know we we say you're not you know you can't get away from me because I'm going to make you successful in real estate, and that's how I get to pay it forward. You know, my education and learning, and I do that once a week, and then the rest of my my day is 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 developing real estate. And you know, one of my hobbies is magic, so I'm always playing with coins and cards and entertaining so have a fun you know but uh that's it oh that's awesome well ken i can't say thanks enough for taking the time to talk i've uh thoroughly enjoyed it i yes. uh, learned learned a lot and uh look forward to doing it again soon yes yes surety companies <laughs> there you go yeah, there you right. go. yeah it was a real pleasure and uh like like you said not a lot of people understand that level of insurance and how important it is you know in 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 moving forward into larger scale real estate. Yeah, no, there's a, uh, in order to really go forward, you've got to have pretty stout financials and, and prove it. You can't just, uh, yeah. you know, say, trust me on that kind of stuff. So yeah. yeah, definitely. All right. Well, again, thank you. And uh, for our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.